is an amazing day to be in the house of God, is it not? If I can get my iPad figured out. Magnets. All right. Well, it is amazing to be uh, with you this morning. Um, we've experienced the presence of God. I don't know how you could not at this point. Um, and I believe just in so much of what this church has been uh, for me. And I would double on what Matt and Megan had just said, that this is a church um, that is a part of what God is doing to change and shape lives, not just in this community, but around the world. And I have experienced that firsthand um, growing up in this church. Um, and I don't take this opportunity lightly. Um, it is a privilege to have grown up in this church. It's a privilege to, to be able to serve this church as uh, the youth pastor here, um, because I'm a product of this church. Um, my family grew up here, and I just want to take a second. I know I've, I've done this both times that I've been up here, but I just think it means that much. Uh, one, to thank my family, my church family, um, my blood family. Um, oh, yeah, thank you. Um, but also there are other people, just because... I've been a part of this church who have become like real family to me. Um, and I just want to take a moment to honor our leaders, um, Pastor Jeremy and Darcy. You have been um, not just my youth pastors, um, but along the way, you've been my mentors and friends. And it's a privilege to be able to, to serve under your leadership. Um, church, you don't know uh, the blessing that we have in our pastors. Um, so can we just show them our appreciation this morning as well? Thank you. Woo, woo, woo. Rise, nurse, rise, nurse. So we have been in this series um, called The Songs That Make Us. And how many of you have enjoyed our series so far that we've been in? It's been an interesting look at, and not just some of the songs that we sing here, but some of the songs that maybe have shaped your life and your view of the Lord. Um, I remember when we were, we were putting together the schedule and we were talking about what this series would entail. I remember the, the Tuesday morning that we were together talking about it and we had the whiteboard pulled up. Uh, we were writing kind of when everybody's going to, to have their week and we were just brainstorming some of the ideas of songs that have been impactful in our lives personally and some of the songs that we sing as a congregation um, that have formed just the way that we talk about and view worship. Um, not even just in a musical sense, but the way that we engage in the act of worship, a lot of times for me, has been formed by what I've surrounded myself with. And music has been a big part of that in my life. And so we're going around the room, everybody's kind of sharing their ideas, and it finally comes to me, and they say, Ryan, what are you thinking on? I say, come on, guys. You know me. That's all I said. <laughs> I said, come on. You guys know the song that I'm going to pick already. And I think Megan went to the board and, and wrote by my name the name of the song that I was going to do today. And she wrote dot, 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 duh. Uh, <laughs> because it was that obvious what it was. And I'm just curious. I, I know our staff knew and some of the tech team and worship team knows because you've practiced the song that we're going to sing later. But I'm curious if you don't know because I've told you already, um, what would you guess? is the song that I'm going to be sharing about today. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It's the anthem. Uh, it's by the Planet Shakers. Uh, there's been a number of different versions throughout the years, and we'll get to all that. Um, but I can tell you story after story about not just how this song, but how music and that perspective of worship has shaped my journey of faith. I grew up going to this church. I went to school here um, through fifth grade. Um, and I was a graduate of this student ministry. And when I was in third grade, I believe, um, like I said, I was at the school. We did this Christmas musical at the school. And it was one of the greatest productions that I've ever been a part of to this day. Um, and I'll tell you why. I was cast as one of the shepherds in the field. Not just any shepherd. I want you to hear me. I was cast as 
the shepherd's dog. <laughs> and my name was Fido. And I was given these floppy dog ears to wear. They were made of cloth. This was put together moments before service. Uh, printed out. It still has a watermark on there. So um, <laughs> don't tell anybody. Uh, but I was Fido. I was a shepherd's dog. It was the pride of my life. And I not only got to wear these floppy dog ears, but I had a solo as well. And here's the thing. Like, growing up, for whatever reason, I don't have a great ability to recall details or uh, really big events in my childhood. I don't know what that's all about. Um, we're not going to get into that today. Um, <laughs> But this play and this musical, I remember very clearly. I remember the words to the solo that I was singing. Um, I have it written down. I'm not going to be, well, that's, that's on me, I guess. I've got the floppy dog ears on. I guess I have to. It had a jazzy feel to it, too. So I was a shepherd's dog named Fido, and this was my song. I was minding my business, tending to my sheep. I was bored to death about half asleep. When out of the blue, right there in the field, the most amazing news was revealed. Now I feel like top dog, cause I had a front row seat. Yeah, I feel like top dog. This canine's life's complete. Now that I've seen an angel before my eyes, it should come as no surprise. I feel like top dog, top dog. That was it. Thank you, thank you. It's for the people. <laughs> and then my, my shepherd owner said, come on, Fido, let's go. And we hopped off the stage and ran off. Um, so that's a little piece of my life shared with you, um, to your enjoyment of my embarrassment. <laughs> but my music teacher at the time, um, was our lead pastor's daughter. Um, and I was asked shortly after this musical performance, if I would be willing to come and sing for the offertory song at church on Sunday morning, which if you don't know what that means, the offertory uh, time was a segment of service uh, where someone would sing or play a special song during the time where the offering plates were being passed around. I think at that time we actually had the, the cool like two-handle basket, flip it around thing, which I don't know where that's gone. That was the greatest invention of all time. Um, but the thing was, when I was asked, you didn't really know what you're getting for the offertory song. Um, there was a mixture of, of different performances and... I won't get into that either, um, but it was generally either someone who did it every week or someone who wanted their kid to do it um, because they had musical ability, um, but sometimes the apple didn't fall as close to the tree as, as they thought. So all this to say, I refused to sing in the offertory song when I was asked if I was interested. And today, through many experiences of ups and downs, I have a very different view of musical worship than when I was growing up. When I finally was able to come into youth ministry, um, I felt like the time we were singing, the time of service that was devoted to doing music, it went on so long, and I couldn't wait for it to be over. We did it in the gym back then. I just wanted to play basketball. That's all I wanted to do. Um, <laughs> and there was a maturity that had to take place for me to get to a different place. The fact of the matter was, one, I only listen to those songs when I was at church. When I was at home, you actually had to buy music at that portion of time. And so um, I wasn't going to pay for it, um, which we didn't really do anyways. You could either, you know, <laughs> get on a, a site called LimeWire um, and illegally download your songs, but you had to pay a price because you could either get a virus or you could get the song. Um, <laughs> how many of you know that's true? Rough times we lived in. But now, like, so much has changed. When I had an encounter with the Lord, he changed the way that I thought. 
And there was, yes, some work on my part that I, I removed some distractions. I changed the things I was filling my life with. Music was one of those huge things for me. That when I gave my life to Jesus, the things that I filled my life with and was consuming changed because he changed me. And now, honestly, you can't keep me from singing. <laughs> I'm always singing. You can hear me coming down the hallway, wherever I'm at. My family can hear me in the shower. You can't, but <laughs> it's a privilege only they get to hear. You probably heard me practicing my top dog song this morning. <laughs> And I'm always singing worship songs. I'm filling my life up with things that remind me of what is valuable and what is true. They remind me of the gospel message. It's a constant retelling in my life of what has been done for me and who God is. And whether you're here today as someone who would say you're a Christian, or if you fall under a different category, maybe you're a skeptic or agnostic, maybe you're an atheist, maybe you fill in the blank. Here's what I'm here to tell you today. The gospel, that is the good news about the victory that has been won for you and for me through Jesus is for all people in any stage of life at all times. I'll say it again. The gospel, the good news about the victory that has been won for you and for me through Jesus is for all people in any stage of life at all times. Oh, nice. It's in Spanish for me, too. Blessings, Benjamin. You can't hear it enough. It doesn't grow old. But this is a warning. Do not put it off. And do not hide away from the gospel. Because the gospel is life to those who believe. Will you pray with me this morning? Lord, you are so good. And we thank you for the experience that we have had already in your presence. We ask, Lord, that you would begin even now, not through my words, not through what I've prepared, but God, simply by your spirit and your truth, Lord, reveal yourself to your people. That we would walk away from this place with an understanding and a confidence in who you are, what you've called us to do, and what you have done to accomplish it all in our place. Lord, help us to receive your message of freedom and victory that is found through Jesus. We ask this in your powerful name. Amen. Amen. So I hope that this series has in some way brought a fresh perspective to you about some of the songs that we sing, that we surround ourselves with, that we you frequently hear at church. I hope that it doesn't just stay here, that they're songs that, that you go and input into your life when I'm at the gym, I don't listen to screamo music. I listen to worship music. I don't sing it out loud in the gym. That would be insane. Um, there are people that do that. Um, you can see me kind of mouthing along with the words. Um, but we have playlists on Spotify. They're filled with the songs that we sing here. I would encourage you to add those. Um, but today we're going to be talking about the anthem, a song that has, has made a big impact in my life. Um, but the message of the anthem is what we're going to celebrate today. It's by the Planet Shakers. Um, this song was, was first released as a spontaneous chorus in 2008, which, surprisingly enough, I found out that it was released in 2008 instead of when I heard it first in 2011 um, on Tuesday this week. So kind of wrecked my life there. Um, when I came to love the song... Um, it was released as a cover um, done by Central Bible College uh, where I was planning to go and did go. It seems like I didn't go, but I did go, and then it closed, and then I went to Evangel. Um, <laughs> but Central Bible College released this album filled with covers of, of these songs in 2011, um, the month that I graduated high school. So the whole summer, I listened to this album that included the anthem nonstop like a ridiculous amount of times. Um, and it's actually where I started to, to hear and learn to sing harmonies was by listening to the song because the, the parts were pretty distinct. Um, but I listened to this album nonstop. And then finally in December of 2012, 
Um, the full song was actually released by the Planet Shakers. Um, so when we have sing the song in the past, many times we've done just the chorus. And the chorus is, is, is hot to touch. It's like the oven. It's too, it's too good. Um, but there's more to the song. And, and when I came on staff here and started helping out uh, with the youth team and then on Sunday morning, um, I said, why don't we do the verses? Like, where, where are the verses? We're missing half of this. And, but I would be amazed if I was not in, like, the top ten of people who have listened to the song of all time. That's one of the questions I have for God. How many cheeseburgers have I eaten in my life? And how many times have I listened to the anthem? Um, but the song is a song that celebrates the, very powerfully the victory that Jesus has won in our place. It's an anthem. And that's the perfect word to describe it. It's a declaration for the church of God to lift up in one unified voice. Not of our hard-fought victory, not of something that we could have ever done, but what God alone has accomplished for us through Jesus. So, are we ready to dive in? You guys excited? All right, cool. I'm done singing now, so um, we're getting into the word of God, so that's better stuff. Um, but we're going to look at that verse first, the first verse, the only verse first. Uh, it says this, by his stripes, we are healed. By his nail pierced hands, we're free. By his blood, we are washed clean. Now we have the victory. So what exactly is the victory that Jesus came to bring? What is he talking about here? If we're going to sing about the victory that we have in Jesus, we need to know what we're talking about. We need to be able to define what the win is. Um, So we're talking about my favorite song today. I'm bringing in my favorite book. Uh, A couple quotes from C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity. Um, And these are a number of quotes. Um, They're within the same couple pages, but um, just so I'm not reading two pages of one of the greatest books of all time. Um, for time's sake, um, I'm splitting them up. So the first quote is this. And now what was the purpose of it all? What did he come to do? Well, to teach, of course. But as soon as, soon as you look into the New Testament or any other Christian writing, you'll find they're constantly talking about something different, about his death and his coming to life again. It's obvious that Christians think the chief point of the story lies here. They think the main thing that he came to earth to do was to suffer and be killed. He goes on, says, the central Christian belief is that Christ's death has somehow put us right with God and given us a fresh start. Theories as to how it did this are another matter. And finally, the last quote. A man can accept what Christ has done without knowing how it works. Indeed, he clearly, he certainly would not know how it works until he has accepted it. We are told that Christ was killed for us, that his death has washed out our sins, and that by dying, he disabled death itself. That is the formula. That is Christianity. I found that to be profound. And I think... As we grow in our faith, obviously we should seek to understand more and more what it is that the cross has accomplished. What Jesus is dying and being raised to life has done for us. I believe that's important. We have to know theology. But for us to accept it, for our faith to be stirred up, and for us to decide to follow after Jesus and accept what he has done for us, I don't have to know everything. Right? Jesus came in order to make a way for us to be in right relationship with God. We may not know exactly how it works, but if we believe that he has accomplished that, that he has done the work, and I believe in that. I confess my sins. I've confessed where I've gone wrong and I've fallen short. We're saved. We don't have to know exactly how it works. 
but we can understand our need for it. And we have to. If we look back at that first verse that we put up there. Thank you. We kind of work backwards. We have the victory by what Jesus has done. By his stripes. That he was whipped and beaten. By his nail pierced hands. By his blood that was shed. Without his victory, we're left broken, we're left bound, and we're left blemished. See, we need that healing. We need that freedom, and we need to be made clean. And with, without what Jesus accomplished in his suffering and his sacrifice, we are left to deal with the problem. So why do we need victory? What is the problem? What is against us? Well, it's easy to see in the sickness and the brokenness and the death and the pain and the fear and confusion that is all around us. That's easy to see that there is a problem. There is something that needs to be addressed and fixed. In every direction, I can see this brokenness. But those things are a symptom of a deeper problem. I had someone share with me just the concept I didn't ever read the complete book, but the concept alone was very thought-provoking. It's from a book called Kill the Spider. That you can see the cause and effect of a spider being around. That you can see the webs. You can see it's where it's been, what it's left behind. The webs are not the problem, though. They're an effect. The spider is the problem. So what is the problem? The problem is sin came into the world. The problem is sin has wrecked God's good creation. And we recognize the problem, but we have to understand who can fix the problem. In Romans chapter 5, we're going to be kind of in the middle of Romans today. I wish I could just read the whole book to you, because uh, it lays it out pretty good. Um, but we're going to start in Romans chapter 5. Verse 12 through 21, it says this. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given, but it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Still, everyone died from the time of Adam to the time of Moses even those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God, as Adam did. See, we see the effect of sin. Sin came into the world. With sin came the penalty of sin, which is death. Where did I stop? Now, oh yeah, there it is. I didn't stop at the end of a verse. I stopped at the end of a sentence. Now, Adam is a symbol a representation of Christ who is yet to come. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of this one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation. But God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one person, one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace 
became more abundant. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's good news. And we're not done with it. It was a rebellion of one man. It was a rebellion of man that came into the world in the beginning through one man, Adam. And I've been there in the place where I want to stand off to the sideline and point and say, Adam, you done messed up. You wrecked it for everyone. But every one of us have rebelled against God in our own way. And actually in the same way. That on our own, of our own accord, in our own free will, we recreate the sin in the garden by trying to be our own God. That was the sin of Satan. And that was a sin that he taught our ancestors. And it has been passed down to each and every one of us. But it's not been made for each and every one of us. We've chosen it. We've set up on our own, trying to find something to fulfill us that's outside of God. And the reality is, it doesn't exist. God is the only one that can fulfill our needs because he has made us to be fulfilled in him. We can't find it anywhere else. So we go to the pre-chorus, if you can put that up there. We're getting into it. The power of sin is broken. Who we just heard about. Jesus overcame it all. He has won our freedom. Jesus has won it all. I told you we're going to be in Romans quite a bit. Because Romans follows kind of this line of, of thinking. As well as the song. Um, in my Bible, the heading directly following what we just read about Adam being contrasted with Jesus, the headline says, sin's power is broken. So it makes sense to keep reading, doesn't it? The power of sin is broken. That is, is what's before us. That's what's been done for us. But how many times do we still feel the effects of sin in our life? If we're honest, how many of us, after we've given our life to Jesus and said, you're the Lord, you're the king over everything, and yet, I still find myself tempted and falling to sin. I think it goes to the point we can know that Jesus' sacrifice and death on the cross has brought me freedom and brought me life, and I can accept it, but I don't quite know exactly how it works. And the beauty and the cool thing is as we grow in our faith and we learn more about what God has done for us and more about his love that's extended to us through Jesus. We understand what Jesus has accomplished as going to die as the Lamb of God, the perfect, sinless Lamb of God who died in our place. And we understand that more and more. We want to sin less and less. More of us is dying. The old man is dying away and the new man is coming to life. So we may not feel in that one moment the power of sin is broken because I feel the effects of sin in my life now. But we also shouldn't take it as an excuse that, oh, well, I'm just sinful. No. God's truth for us this morning is that we have victory over the power of sin. It is done, dealt with. But our job is, is to daily come before the Lord and daily say, God, you're the king. Your way, not mine. Allow me to die, myself, my desires, what I want, really, and let it become aligned with what you want and what you desire. As we do that day after day, we find that I don't put myself in situations where I can desire sin and where I can be tempted. Because I desire holiness. I desire right standing with God. I want to be his image in the world. 
so I don't associate with my old self. That's what repentance is. We'll talk about that too. Um, But Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 11, sin's power is broken is a heading. I know it's not in the original. It's just for fun, I guess. So you know what you're getting into. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we were joined in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, we also now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that the power, so that the sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now he lives, or now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. That is where our victory comes from. And if we come in here to church, then we hear about this victory, and we say we believe it, but this is the only place where I act like I have victory when I raise my hands or when I do church things We're missing the purpose of that victory. The purpose of the victory is to give us victory in the world, victory over sin, that we live as people who are the image of God and we act like it. We have a hope that is unshakable, not for after I die and wake up, right? The hope is for today. And we have the promise that one day, that God will come to make right what he intended to be right. He created the world good, and he intends it to be that way. One day his promise is that he is going to come and restore the world according to his will by bringing justice, by making right every wrong. As we come to a close, we're going to go into the chorus of this song. It says, hallelujah, you have won the victory. Hallelujah, you have won it all for me. For death could not hold you down. You are the risen king, seated in majesty. You are the risen king. Church, the gospel message is for all people in any season of life at all times. But do not put it off. Because there will be a time where it becomes too late to respond. And on that day, I want to be found faithful, doing the work that God has called me to do as his new creation. When I stand before the Lord, whether it is when he returns Or after I die, I want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my peace. Enter into the wholeness. In that chorus, the words hallelujah are repeated. Um, I don't know if those those are not very common words used today. Uh, If you look through the Hebrew Bible, and many of the Psalms include this, this phrase, hallelujah. 24 times it occurs in the Hebrew Bible. 
It's one of few words in the Bible today that we have that is left as a transliteration of a Hebrew word that means praise be to God or praise the Lord. Now, why is this important? Well, we're going to sing the song. And I want you to know what it means. <laughs> but the word hallelujah is only used four times in the New Testament. And they all occur in one chapter. Revelation 19. And this picture in Revelation 19, I'm not going to read it for you, um, but I would encourage you to go and read it. Um, some versions do translate and say, praise the Lord. But the saying is used four times. It's coming from the saints of God who are in heaven declaring the victory of God. And it's this wonderful picture of the saints of God who are declaring the praise of God in heaven because he has won the ultimate victory that he has judged the world and he's avenged every right, every wrong he's made right he's brought justice to those who have suffered in the world as a result of their faith in him and they rejoice because Jesus is returning to the earth to reign once and forevermore that is the picture. When we sing the song, transport in your imagination to the throne of heaven where the saints are before the Lord and they sing, hallelujah. Praise the Lord that you are the risen king. You are seated in majesty. It's an anthem, not of this earth, but of the heavenly realm. Of the people of God is reserved for those who belong to Christ that are found in him and on that day when he returns I want to be found hidden in Christ you no longer see me you don't know who Ryan is you know who Christ is that he is what my life points to on that day only one thing will matter are you in right relationship with the Lord We're going to take communion together because I think that's a, one of the best retellings and way to remember it's what's given to us, to remember what has been done to bring us victory. But the thing that matters right now, are you in right relationship with God? On that day, will he say, I, I knew you, you spent time with me. You gave your life to me. We say, depart from me. I never knew you. We never gave him our everything. We never turned from our way to give him our all. When we are united with Jesus, we're not just going to sing a, a song of victory. We're going to have a feast of victory. Jesus said, until that day comes, I want you to have this meal in remembrance of me. And today, if you want to be made right with God, the one who created you, the one who loves you, the one who gave his life for you, the response is, is simple. It doesn't mean it's always easy, but it's straightforward. Repent. Turn from your wicked ways. Acknowledge your sin. Give it to the Lord and believe in the Lord Jesus. Repent and believe. And maybe you've been told at some point in your life, well, you need to go make it right with that person. I've heard my mom say it before. Usually it's actually my brothers that would say it to me because I whined and complained to her and then I got my way. But when you engage in that, that act of being reconciled to another person, what do you have to do? You have to be sorry. You have to be humble. You can't go to them and say, no, you're the problem when actually it was me that got myself in this situation, the kids call that gaslighting. It's a term you might want to be familiar with. No, if you want to be made right with someone, if you value the relationship, you have to humble yourself and acknowledge some things are bigger than me. With a friend, 
a family member. With God, it is a little different because Christ has done every bit of the work for you and me to be made right with God. And I think we have to be careful with the way that we talk about this because, because Christ has done the work, we say it's, it's a free gift. Grace is, is given to us freely, but the price is great. Because what is expected of us is not that we continue to do the thing that separates us from God. I don't continue to act like I am the God of my own life and King. I have to die. I have to lay down everything before the Lord. I have to become nothing. That's why baptism is that symbol. It's because I'm actually going to die to myself. And I'm raised to new life that is hidden in Christ. And so today, we're going to do communion. Um, I ask you, you have the, the, the elements before you. Um, if you're online, join with us. Grab something to participate, something solid, something liquid. But I don't remember who told me this when I first gave my life to Jesus. When I did it seriously, someone set me aside. When we do communion, they said, one, don't enter into it lightly. Because communion is something that we're given to remember what Christ has done in our place. How dare I enter into something that the Lord has given us to remember what he has done and do it with a passive heart. And so before I ever enter in communion, no matter who's talking, I say, Lord, reveal to me in my heart where I've sinned against you. Many times I don't have to ask him. I usually know, right? And help me to surrender my life again to you. Help me to place you as you ought to be, king over my life. Because you're the king who came to the earth that you created. And your way of being exalted as king was to suffer and die in our place so that you'd be raised to life. So I'm going to give you a few moments just as the band plays for a few moments to take that moment with the Lord. Maybe it's today. I need to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus and make him Lord of my life for the first time. Or maybe it's, maybe for the first time it's serious, but it's for you. And maybe today it's just to seek the Lord and ask what is in my heart that ought not to be there because it's taking place in my life where you should reign and rule completely and fully. Let me give you a few moments to do that. We don't need to raise your hand. It's a moment between you and the Lord. Um, let's not let it just be a moment, right? When we're done with communion, we're going to celebrate the victory in Jesus' name.